Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. howdy. It is really good to, to be back with you today. I'm always just honored and uh, just consider it a huge privilege to get to come and be here at FaithBridge. Um, I'll tell you this, when I was in high school, I ran cross country and track, and I know that might surprise many of you because you probably had me pegged as a linebacker, but that's not true. Um, I was a runner, and um, you know, I, I loved cross country races, and I was really fortunate to have a, a very supportive dad, and I always knew where my dad was on the cross country course because He's Middle Eastern, so he had an accent, so I could always hear him say, go, Timothy, go, go, go. But uh, my dad would videotape every single one of our races. And uh, after we would get home, my brother and I had this routine of hooking up the video camera to the TV, and we would watch our races. We loved to do that. And I will never forget this one day, we were watching one of our races, and my brother and I we thought that we saw something, but it happened so quickly that we weren't quite sure that we saw what we thought that we saw. So we, we rewound the tape and then we put it in slow motion. And uh, man, it was, it totally, we, it blew us away. You won't think it's a big deal, but we, what happened, and I would show you the tape, but then you'd have to see me in incredibly short shorts, and I don't think you'd ever recover from that, so let me just tell you, if you were to see the tape, here's what you would see. You'd see about 300 high school guys standing on a starting line, and then um, the pistol goes off, and about 300 guys just take off at an all-out sprint, and they make their way down this field and they go around a baseball backstop and then as this, this group of 300 runners is heading back towards the video camera and we're just two minutes into the race at this point, as this group of 300 runners is making their way towards the video camera, one of the runners that's in the top 10, like he's one of the first few runners, just in a moment in time, just steps off the course and walks away. It's, it's like he, he just in that moment woke up and had the thought like, I'm in a cross country race and I don't even run cross country. <laughs> and he stepped off the course and just walked away. And here's the reason that it was so weird. He didn't, he didn't grab his leg like he had pulled a hammy. He didn't like walk off with his hands over his head like he didn't bend over like he was about to, to throw up. No, it's just like he realized, I don't wanna be here at all and he stepped up the course and just walked away. And as I thought about that video, the thought that I had was, I wonder what his reason was. Like, I wonder what his reason was for just stepping off the course and walking away. And the reason I even bring this up this morning is because I wonder the same, t I wonder the same thing sometimes when I look at those who have considered themselves Christians and they've ended up stepping off the course and walking away from Jesus. The reality is, if you read the scriptures, uh, the Christian life is referred to by the Bible as a race. And you might know some people, you might have been one of those people, but at, at different points, people who consider themselves Christians might step off the course and walk away either permanently or Temporarily, I mean, I think about um, <clears throat> a guy who is really my closest friend in high school for a good amount of time. Man, when he was in high school, he was all about Jesus. I mean, he was at church every week. He would get to school early doing Bible studies. He wore the shirts. He had the bracelets. I mean, he listened to the music, you name it. And now this guy wants to have nothing to do with Jesus. I've worked with uh, countless students over the years. And um, I, I think about one girl in particular who 
um, when she was in high school. She considered herself a Christian. Now, if you were to get onto her Facebook profile, she would label herself as an atheist. You look at various Facebook profiles of people, and it would appear, at least from the pictures that they post, that those who once wanted to have something to do with Jesus, those who had called themselves Christians now have stepped up the course and walked away. I think about one guy who I met with from a church I used to work at, uh, married with, uh, with a daughter, and he just, uh, we, we sat at Starbucks, I'll never forget, he gave me a, a Christian book and was encouraging me as a pastor on how I can rest and and pursue the Lord. And now he's a guy who divorced his wife, left his family, married someone half his age, and now has said that he would never step foot back in the church, at least the church that I was once a part of. And I just, I I see these people and I can't help but ask the question, I wonder what their reason is. Like what led them to step off the course and walk away? This morning, we're going to look in the scriptures, and what I want to do is I want to show you what I believe are the top three reasons that people inevitably in this world step off the course and walk away from Jesus. And it's going to be very important that you are familiar with these three reasons, because what you need to know is that as you journey through life, no matter what stage of life you're in right now, as you journey through life, you are going to come to these uncomfortable intersections with Jesus. And as you come to these various intersections in your life, you're going to be prompted to answer the same question that Jesus' 12 friends, the disciples, had to answer in John chapter 6. And I want you to see this question. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 6. That's where we'll be this morning, John chapter 6. And as you're turning there, let me just say this. If if you're here this morning and you're kind of hearing the topic thinking, man, this doesn't apply to me at all. I'm so far into this journey with Jesus, there's no, no turning back now. If that's you just thinking, man, that will never be me. Well, let me just give you a bit of warning. Peter thought that he would never deny Jesus, and then just hours later, he stepped up the course and walked away, at least, at least for that evening. But even beyond that, I'll just say, you know what? Uh, In every single cross-country race I ran in high school, if you were to position yourself as a spectator at the finish line, if if you were to only choose two spots, if you were to first watch the start and then watch the finish, what you would see at the start is all these people starting off at an all out sprint. And then if you were to go to the finish, you would see runner after runner barely make it across the finish line. They would start out strong and finish weak. And so that will be a temptation for every person here this morning. So it might not be you stepping off the course and walking away, but it might be you just barely limping into heaven at the end of your life. So uh, let's, let's take a look here. I want to give you the top three reasons that I believe that people step off the course and walk away either temporarily or permanently. And three, these are really three reasons why people don't end up finishing their journeys with Jesus strong. Go ahead and, uh, go ahead and find in John chapter 6, verse uh, 66. So just to give you a little context, I believe that Jesus, in John chapter 6, gives his most unpopular sermon ever. Like in the world's, according to the world's standards, Jesus just bombed this message. And we know that because of, look at what it says in John chapter 6, verse 66. It says this, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. 
So we're going to see in just a little bit what Jesus actually said. But Jesus, according to these people, bombed this message to the point where these people end up stepping off the course and walking away. One commentator said that so many people probably left Jesus at this point that there were, there were little more than just Jesus' 12 friends left at this moment. And as all of these people end up stepping off the course and walking away from Jesus, Jesus then turns to his 12 friends, the disciples, and he asks them this question in verse 67. Look at what he says. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Do you want to go away as well? Do you guys now want to step off the course and walk away? You need to know this isn't just a question for the 12. This is a question that every single one of us will have to answer at different points in our lives. Every single one of us will come to these uncomfortable intersections with Jesus where we will have to answer the question, do you want to go away as well? Now, um, look back with me at verse 25. Let me show you the first reason that people often step off the course and walk away from the Lord. Let me read you verse 25. It's going to feel like we're starting a movie halfway through, but we'll read it, and then I will explain it to you. It says this. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you were seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. So let me just provide you the context to what we just read, okay? Uh, Earlier in John chapter 6, Jesus holds the largest impromptu barbecue in the history of mankind where he feeds 5,000 plus people with a fish and bread combo meal that he got out of a little kid's Spider-Man lunchbox. All right, that's what happens. Jesus takes a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread and he turns it into a massive feast, And if you were to go back and read the story, you would read that the people in attendance at this barbecue ate their fill. They ate their fill. And the reason that that's important is because many of the people in the crowd um, were extremely poor to the point that they didn't know where their next meal would come from. Many of these people probably hadn't felt the sensation of being full in a long time. And so these people go to sleep that night full, potentially for the first time. Now, during the night, uh, without the people knowing, Jesus makes his way to the other side of the sea. And then the next morning, these people who ate that meal the night before, they wake up. And what thought do they have? I wonder what Jesus is thinking about doing for breakfast, okay? (laughs) And so they take off looking for Jesus. And they go to all of this effort, they can't find him, and when they finally track him down on the other side of the sea, Jesus just calls them out on their motives. He says, guys, let's just call it what it is. Okay, you haven't gone to all of this trouble to find me uh, because you saw me do something supernatural with a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. No, you've gone to all of this effort, er, effort because you're hoping that I hook you up with another combo meal. That's why you've gone to all this effort. And they don't argue with them. See, it's interesting. These people believed that their greatest need was physical food. They believed their greatest need was the satisfaction of their physical appetite. And so they come to Jesus, seeking after him, hoping that he will meet what they perceive to be their greatest need. But Jesus sees past their physical hunger to the spiritual hunger of their souls. And so he begins to try and get them, he's he's trying to get them to to kind of trade up from this need for physical food to this need for spiritual food. And that's what he's trying to tell them when he says, what, what does he say? He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. He's trying to get them to trade up, saying, you have a greater need. 
Your greatest need isn't just physical food. No, you're, there's the deeper hunger of your soul. So your greatest need is for spiritual food, but they don't see it. They think that Jesus is just talking about this ridiculously great bread that never gets stale or moldy. And so just think about it. These people go to all of this effort. They track Jesus down. They believe their greatest need is physical food. Jesus starts talking about this better bread. And so they're like, man, this was a great day to wake up and go looking for Jesus because we felt like we needed bread. And now Jesus is promising us this better bread, this bread that doesn't get stale or moldy. So Jesus, if you have a better bread, Please give it to us. Imagine the disappointment. Imagine the disappointment. In John 6, 35, when Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. Hey, you guys think you need bread? Man, I've got this incredible bread for you. Jesus, give us this bread. I'm the bread. Wah, wah. Like, talk about disappointing. It's a, oh, no, 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 that, that's not what we wanted. See, it's interesting. I think one of the reasons that these people stepped off the courses and walked away was because they believed their greatest need was physical food and all Jesus offered them was, his, was himself. See, think about it right now. What do you believe is your greatest need? I'll I'll position it this way. What is the if only in your heart? What's the if only? What do you believe you truly need to be happy in this life? What's the if only in your heart? You know what? If only... If only I could find a spouse. If only I could find a better spouse. If only... I could get a job, if only I could get a better job, if only we were more financially secure, if only we had better behaved children, if only God could heal me physically, if only God would heal this loved one physically, if only God would give me some relief from the storms of life. Like, what do you believe is the if only in your heart? I need you to know Jesus cares deeply about your needs. He cares deeply about your needs. Yet at the same time, you need to know that Jesus knows you better than you know you. Jesus knows your needs better than you know your needs. And Jesus believes that your greatest need is more of him. There's going to be times where you believe that your greatest need is a spouse or a better spouse or a job or a better job or physical healing. And in those moments, all Jesus is going to offer you is himself. And when you come to that uncomfortable intersection and you sit in that disappointment, you're going to be prompted to answer a question, do you want to go away as well? Do you want to step off the course and walk away? You know when it's really tough? When it's really tough is when you feel like you've done everything right. When you feel like you've been doing everything God wants you to do and all he does is drop down himself for you. You feel like you've been doing everything right. You've been going to church. You've been reading your Bible. You've been praying. You've been giving. You've been treating people well. You've been minimizing sin in your life. And all Jesus offers you is himself. I just want to kind of shed some light on what's happening if in those moments when you feel like you've done everything right, Jesus only offers you himself and then you feel betrayed or frustrated or like Jesus has let you down. Do you know what's happening in those moments? Do you want to know why you're so frustrated? The reason that you're so frustrated is because Jesus has just informed you that the system that you've been operating with doesn't actually work. And what, oh, just to be really clear, what, he's, what Jesus just informed you in those moments where he drops only himself down and you feel frustration because of that, what Jesus is letting you know is that he refuses to be manipulated. 
Let, let me explain it this way, okay? Uh, ladies, some of you were these girls growing up like with your dads. And if you're a dad in here and you have a, a daughter, like she can probably do some things to have you wrapped around her finger. Like there's those times where she might come and sit down next to you and take your hand and um, put her arm around you and look into your eyes and tell you how much she loves you. And just in that moment, you just become hypnotized. You're like, uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> really? Great. The next morning, you wake up and you're like, I could have sworn I had $20 in my wallet. I have no clue what happened to it. See, what that is right there is that's called, that's called manipulation. <laughs> it's doing what you think you need to do to get what you want. But watch a daughter who does all these things to get what she wants from her dad. Watch what happens when the dad says, I'm not giving you any money right now. What does she do? What does she feel? She feels anger. She feels frustration. Why? Why? because her dad isn't operating the way that she thinks he should operate. And the reason that many of us will feel this bitterness, this frustration, like God has let us down when we feel like we've done everything right and he hasn't provided what we want him to provide, the reason for that frustration is because God just informed us, I refuse to be manipulated. And in that moment, what you're realizing is that all of your good works haven't been works of worship, they've been works of manipulation. And in those moments of frustration and disappointment, you're gonna be prompted to answer a question. Do you wanna step off the course and walk away? Do you want to go away as well? Now look back at the text. So the first reason that many people will step off the course and walk away is because Jesus won't give you what you think you need most. And we see the second reason starting over in verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So just to be clear, Jesus is making a massive claim about himself right here. What Jesus is identifying is the fact that every single person in this room has a soul that hungers for something. Every single one of us has hungers for love and acceptance and approval and significance. We hunger for, for pleasure and uh, we hunger for for worth, and what Jesus is declaring when he says, I'm the bread of life, he's saying, I'm the one and only one. He doesn't say that I am a slice of the bread. No, he says, I am the bread. He's saying, I'm the only one. I'm the one and only one who can show up in your soul and satisfy its deepest hungers. I like to refer to Jesus as the Walmart of life. If you're not into Walmart, you can go with Super Target, but you think about Walmart. <laughs> Walmart is like the one place where you can go to find everything you could need to live in this world. Like you can go to Walmart, the family can go to Walmart, and in one trip, you can buy a video game, a pair of tidy whities and a tire for your car. <laughs> All in the same trip because it's a one-stop shop for anything you could need. Jesus is the Walmart of life. He's not just the, the source of eternal life, he's the source of all life. He's the source of emotional life. He is the source of relational life. He is the source of physical life. He is the source of spiritual life. Jesus is the one and only one who has what your soul truly needs. He has everything that your soul needs. That's what Jesus is declaring here. Not that he is a slice of the bread, but he is the bread of life. And then he goes on and watch this, verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. 
For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Do you see what he's saying? Jesus is claiming to have a a special relationship with God the Father. And he's actually saying, hey, you know that place, heaven, that you plan to go to when you die? I actually have already been there. Like you aim to go from here to there, I came from there to here. I've already been. It's a claim to divinity. It's a claim to have a special relationship, a relationship with God the Father that no one else here has. He's claiming to have a special purpose, a purpose that no one else has. And he goes on in verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Jesus is declaring that the only way, God's plan, God's will, if you want to find yourself in the middle of God's will, then his will starts with you understanding who Jesus is and what he has come to accomplish. That Jesus came to reconcile you to God. And the only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus Christ, that's it. You think about a ski lift, if you ever go skiing or snowboarding, if you take the lift to the top of the mountain and you were to stand on the top of the mountain, you would see these different ski lifts that all arrive at the same point. And we live in this world right now that declares there's no absolute truths. And you know what? What's right for you isn't necessarily right for me, and what's right for me isn't necessarily right for you. And so you kind of pick the way to God that's right for you, and it really doesn't matter. We can all just kind of coexist. Every way is the right way as long as, as, long as it's the way for you. And they all ultimately lead to God. And Jesus is saying that's just not true. If you want to experience eternal life with God in heaven when you die, Jesus is saying it's going to have everything to do with me. So watch the people's response in verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Joseph, the son, is, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? One of the reasons that these people stepped up the course and walked away is simply because they could not get on board with the claims of Jesus. And the reality is that every single person here has to deal with the claims of Jesus as expressed in the Bible. Uh, Several years ago, I was on a plane, and I think this is what I saw. And I can't say with certainty, but I believe that the guy sitting just across the aisle from me, I, I saw he had his Bible out, and I think he had a highlighter, and, and then I, 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 I could have sworn, and maybe I just my eyes were playing tricks on me, but, but what I believe that he had in his hand was a whiteout pen. He was going through the Bible and whiting out certain things, and I just thought, you know what, that's what, that's, that's the kind of spirituality that we want. We want a spirituality where we can take this Bible and have a highlighter and a whiteout pen. We can have a highlighter to highlight the things we really like and a whiteout pen to cross out the things that we don't. We want to be able to take Jesus' claims and say, I can definitely get on board with that. I cannot get on board with that. And the reality with Christianity is that this book is considered the Word of God. And it is not meant to just be a source for truth. It is supposed to be the one true authoritative source of truth in our lives. And according to this book, we can never be good enough for God, period. We cannot be good enough for God. It doesn't matter how hard you try. If God is perfect and we are not, it is impossible for imperfect people to be good enough for a perfect God. We can never be good enough for God. That's what makes Christianity different than every other religion because every other religion says, here's what you do to get to God. 
Christianity says you couldn't do enough to get to God, and so because you couldn't get to God, God came to you. Jesus Christ stepped out of heaven and into earth. He lived the life you couldn't, died the death you deserved to die, was raised to life so that you too could be raised to a new life. And this new life only comes through faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. This is the reality of Christianity. This is the massive claim of Christianity. And some of you are gonna have a problem with that at some point. You're gonna reach this point where you just can't get on board with that kind of exclusivity and you're gonna be tempted to step off the course and walk away. Can you get on board with the claims of Christianity? Because this book makes some massive claims and sometimes it makes some hard claims. You know, my brother is a part of an apologetics ministry and he was just letting me in on some of the correspondence that he's had with a man who considers himself one who has deconverted from Christianity. That he would have considered himself a Christian at one time, but as he's just explored, as he's processed through the claims of Christianity, his big deal is he cannot get on board with the fact that God would make us, and he's made us, to fail. And he's put put us here on earth knowing that we would fail, and then he made the punishment for not believing in him eternal separation. And he cannot deal with that. And he looks at God and considers him very unjust. If there is a God, then he is an unjust God. And he has stepped off the course and walked away in his adult life. Now the great news is, is for issues like that, this text has incredible, grace-filled, soul-satisfying answers. It absolutely does. But you need to know, one of the reasons that people step off the course and walk away is because of the claims of Christianity. And at some points in your life, it's possible that someone's going to get a hold of your ear. If you're a young high school student, you're going to go off to college and a professor is going to get in your ear. You're going to be watching some TV show and it's going to get in your ear and it's going to prompt you to answer a question. Do you want to go away as well? Look back at the text. Verse 51 Watch how Jesus goes on. He says this, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life Uh, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now look at verse 60. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? So just imagine, Jesus just goes into this portion of his sermon where he says, hey, if you want to have anything to do with me, if you want to experience eternal life, eat my flesh, drink my blood. What do you think his 12 friends are thinking? Like, Jesus, man, whoa, bad detour, bro. Okay, go back to you just maybe being the bread of life, or why don't you just feed some people again, okay? But this whole eat my flesh and drink my blood thing, you, you took a really bad detour. That's highly unpopular. Now, just to state the obvious, Jesus is not being literal here. Need to be very clear there. Jesus is not being literal. Literal here, what he's saying is actually really beautiful because what Jesus is unpacking is what it truly means to be a Christian. He's foreshadowing his death on the cross that his blood would be shed, his body would be broken for us. And what he's saying is, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you won't have eternal life. To eat his flesh and drink his blood is simply to personalize what what he would accomplish on the cross. It's saying that that's what it means to be a true Christian. It's to personalize Jesus' victory on the cross. It's to say, Jesus, I need my sin to become your sin. 
and I need your victory over my sin to become my victory. See, there's a big difference between knowing about what Jesus did on the cross and personalizing what Jesus did on the cross. That's what Jesus is talking about here. But unfortunately, the people that he's talking to took him literally. Did you see what they said in verse 20? I mean, verse 60? They said, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. That word hard in the Greek, it it doesn't mean, they're not saying, you're hard to understand. No, it means harsh or offensive. See, Jews were forbidden from eating meat that still had blood in it. So when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, imagine how that goes across in this crowd. It's highly offensive to them because they take him literally. And here's the sad thing. This is, this is the sad thing, is that Jesus is speaking words that will bring life. And instead of these words being interpreted as words that bring life, they're interpreted as words that steal life. And so these people step off the course and walk away. Here's what you need to know. When you take this book, you know, this scripture, these scriptures, these words from God are meant to lead us to life. These words are never meant to steal life from us. But when some lie takes root in your mind where you begin to believe that God's commands, God's words don't give life, they steal life, I promise you, you will be prompted to answer a question, do you want to go away as well? I think one of the greatest examples I can give you is simply romantic relationships, whether it's, whether it's, um, you know, if you're in middle school or high school or college, you think about, uh, you know, God's command is, ke- is to keep the marriage bed pure. But when you look out at your school, and it seems like the people having the most fun are the people who are um, buying in the mentality of if it feels good now, you should probably do it now. When you see that, something in you might begin to believe that God's commands isn't, they're not meant to give life, they're actually meant to steal life. And you're gonna be prompted to step off the course and walk away. If you're a young adult, if you're, a, if you're single right now, and you're kind of on the, the tour of weddings during the summer, and your wedding isn't on one of the tour stops, you know what, God's command says don't be unequally yoked. It's this idea of if, you're, if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, then, then only marry someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. But something in you might start connecting to another guy or another girl who is not a follower of Jesus Christ and you're gonna begin to look at that command of God and you're gonna begin to believe that it's meant to to steal life, not give it. And you're gonna be prompted to step off the course and walk away. Or I see this in, in marriages where God's word says, what God therefore has joined together, let not man separate. But you're gonna get well into marriage and you're not gonna feel in love with your spouse anymore. And you're gonna begin to believe that the best thing you can do is just go in two totally different directions. And you're gonna begin to see that command as a command that steals life instead of uh, one that gives life. I mean, I think about this woman who had been married for years, four kids, and uh, she just felt like her husband had, a, had been a bonehead for one too many years. And she had fallen out of love with him. And, uh, and she wanted to move forward with a divorce. And so she withdrew from Christian community. She surrounded herself by people who would just tell her what she wanted to hear. And she began to experience the single lifestyle again. And she slowly drifted away from God. See, this is what happens when you begin to believe that God's truths, God's commands don't give life, they steal life you're gonna be prompted to answer a question, do you want to go away as well? And maybe you'll make a conscious decision where you say yes, and other times you just begin to make make gradual choices that prompt this subtle 
drifting away. I want you to see how the disciples answered Jesus' question. Look again real quick at verse 67. Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter stands up as kind of the spokesman for the group and he says this, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, yes, Jesus, there are times when we don't feel like you give us what we think we need. And yes, Jesus, there's times where you say things like eat my flesh and drink my blood and we struggle to get on board with your claims. And yes, Jesus, there's times where we feel like there is a better way than your command, but Jesus, to whom shall we go? Because you are the one who has the words of eternal life. Life. I'll close by just telling you this. Uh, the, the race that I would run in high school in cross country was a 3.1 mile race. It's a 5K. Many of you guys have run 5Ks, but I'll just tell you how the race would go. Okay, the, the first mile was always the easy mile because the gun would go off and 300 people would take off at an all-out sprint and you would just be full of all this adrenaline and you would just be surrounded by people all moving quickly and so it would encourage you to, to move as fast as you could and the adrenaline would just propel you forward. But then you'd reach mile two. And by mile two, the race kind of spreads out And you can often find yourself in what I call no man's land where the the person in front of you is too far ahead to catch and the person behind you is is just too far behind to, to slow down and wait. And so all you are left to do is run by yourself and think about the question, um, why did I choose cross country in the first place? (laughs) Because maybe a side cramp kind of kicks in at that time and you're just miserable. And you just begin to think there's so many other things. I woke up at 5 a.m. to do this as a high school kid. But then you get to mile three. And then you begin to sense that the finish is near. And there's more spectators along the side. And there's more people who know your name. And people are calling out your name cheering you on and as you begin to see the finish line in sight and you hear people cheering you on it unlocks these reserve tanks of energy that you didn't even know that you had and it propels you forward and you finish the race and you collapse on the ground and you feel uh, it's just this sensation of it, it hurt but I made it, and I'm so glad I made it, and I'm so glad I didn't give up. And and there's just the glory that comes from finishing well. And the reason I tell you that is that that's a lot like life. You know what, there's gonna be a lot of mile ones in your life where running with Jesus is, is easy, and it's exciting, and there's adrenaline, and people are right beside you kind of pushing you forward and everything just works, but then you're gonna hit some mile twos. And it's gonna be tough and there's gonna be frustrations, there's gonna be disappointments, and there's going to be moments in those mile twos where you begin to question, why did I even choose this way in the first place? But hang on because mile three is coming. And the finish line is ahead, there are people cheering you on. That's what I'm here to do today. That's why small groups exist, to cheer one another on, saying keep going. Do not give up. It is worth it. Press hard to the finish line because a day is coming where you're going to cross that line and you're going to spend all of eternity with God in heaven, enjoying Jesus Christ, the bread of life, this soul-satisfying one for all of eternity. So as you leave here today and you come to these awkward intersections with Jesus in your life, when you're prompted to answer the question, do you want to go away as well? My hope is that you would respond just as the disciples did. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let's pray together.
Lord Jesus, we praise you for who you are and what you've done, that you are indeed the bread of life. You, Jesus, are the one who has the words of eternal life. And Lord, I just imagine that there's people in this room this morning who might just be hanging by a thread, wondering if it's really worth it, wanting to step off the course and walk away or or just kind of take their foot off the gas. So I just pray that you'd take hold of their hearts, that you'd take their hearts, seal it this morning. Encourage them today. May we finish well, Lord God, because to whom shall we go? We need you. We love you. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello, my name is Adam McIntyre, and I am here with Timothy Atik, who just preached a sermon on pursuing Jesus, on not deviating from the path, on staying strong in your pursuit of Jesus. Timothy, thank you so much you for being here with us today. Glad to be back at Faith Bridge. Absolutely. Yeah, we love having you here, Thanks. always. Uh, we received a, uh, a number of questions um, pertaining your, to your sermon, and uh, the first question was, how can you pursue your wants and your desires while still also pursuing Jesus at the same time? Yeah. What do you think? Well, I think that, uh, you know, what I want to correct is, is that those two things have to be two separate things that I think, you know, th- there's two ways to look at it. Number one, I think that the, the call to be a disciple of Jesus Christ comes from Jesus. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So there, there is an aspect to the Christian walk where there are, where you will at times have to, de- de- you will have to deny your desires. Sure. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad, a bad thing. At the same time, I look at passages like Psalm 37, four, which says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I look at John 15, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What this is speaking to is that the more you know Jesus, the, the hope is that his heart or your heart would resonate with his heart. His desires would become your desires. And so that your desires and following him would all, all be moving in the same direction. Exactly. Because honestly, you can only go so long having n- no desire that aligns with Jesus yet trying to, to follow him. If right. you're always just having to fight off these desires that aren't honoring to Jesus and there's never a time where you desire anything that he anything he desires, that's a miserable place to be. And the good news is, is that's not what he wants right. for you. He wants, he cares about your heart. He doesn't just care about you managing your behavior, no matter what your exactly. desires are. He right. wants your desires to slowly but surely align with his. Absolutely. Yeah. So the more we follow Jesus, the more we kind of adopt his worldview, the more we look at the world through the lens of Christ. And so our desires begin to line up more and more But that's a lifelong process. So please don't hear me say that it's just going to come to this point where it's just easy. You always Mm -hmm. desire to do what Jesus wants you to do. No, the call is still deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. There's every day you're going to have to make choices where you Mm -hmm. do things, not because it, it, it feels right, but because you know it's right. Absolutely. Every day you're going to have that temptation to want to veer off the path. To, yeah. or to just quit the race But altogether. that's the importance of studying the Word because right. the, the Word of God shows us the way of God. And so, you know, if you think about the amount of truth that your heart is exposed to or the amount of lies it's exposed to from the world versus the amount of truth it's exposed to from the Word of God, a lot of times that can be lopsided, that your heart is exposed to a lot more lies than truth Absolutely. each day, yeah. which means there's always going to need to be that reshaping towards his desires. Absolutely. And speaking of which, there's a lot of people, I think, while they're running the race, um, through whatever reason, maybe they have fallen into a lie or maybe they have grown weary or or whatever the case may be, where they just begin to veer off the track. Sure. um, And 
uh, where maybe they're following Jesus well in some areas of their lives, but in other areas, uh, Jesus is completely absent yep. from their lives. Or there's some people even who might quit the race altogether, yeah. might decide, you know what, I'm done following Jesus. So there were a lot of questions that came in um, around that area of, uh, like of assurance of salvation, sure. wondering, you know, if I once followed Jesus and then I stopped, am I still saved? Or if I'm only following Jesus in some areas yeah. of my life, but not over here, am I... Am yeah. I still saved? Yeah. And so what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the beautiful news of the scriptures is that we can be confident that if we know Jesus, that we have eternal life. And that, that's something that Jesus never wants us to question. I don't think, I, you know, and the reason I say that is because of, of tons of scriptures. I mean, my favorite that speaks to assurance of salvation comes in 1 John 5, right. uh, maybe verses 11 through 13. But in there, John says, he who has the son has life. Mm -hmm. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. And then he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know mm -hmm. that you have eternal life. And so it's very simple. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. Romans chapter eight, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a promise of your inheritance. Uh, John 10, that we are in the Father's hands. Jesus says nothing can snatch us out of the Father's hands. I mean, you look throughout the scriptures and there's this, there's this um, you can have confidence that you have eternal life. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And that justification, it's, it's past tense. It's, right. you know, justification is a, is a moment in time where you are declared righteous mm -hmm. before God. And so, you know, justification is a moment in time. Sanctification is a lifelong process right. of being conformed to the image of Jesus. And so, you know, um, when it comes to whether someone can know if they're saved or not, a lot of times people just want to look to how they're living in the moment. Right. And I would just say, if you always do that, you're going to struggle. Right. Yeah. You know, assurance has to come from what Jesus has done for you, that you are assured that Jesus truly did die for you and Jesus truly has justified you before That's the Father. So when people ask me, do you believe that I'm saved? Or how do you know if someone's truly saved? You can look to their actions, but that that's dangerous. Sure. I look to, I have to ask the question, what do they truly believe? Right. That That's really the question. People say, well, I prayed a prayer here. Their assurance is in that prayer, not in Jesus. Absolutely. But people say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, rose from the dead. Then I believe that they have eternal life. Then the question becomes, okay, if that's what you've truly believed, then where, what lies have you believed along the way mm -hmm. about what the normal Christian life should look like? Right. Because if you're willfully sinning in these areas, then you've bought into a lie that Jesus is okay with that when right. he's actually called you to more. Exactly. He wants us to not only look forward to eternal life, but a full life now here. That's exactly right. Uh, and so that's why it matters how we live in all areas yeah. of, our, of our lives. And I think it's helpful yeah. to remember too that you know, God desires to see all men come to know him, yeah. to receive salvation. I think w when you remember those things, um, that God's not waiting for you to screw up so he can check your name off of a list or yeah. something like that. Yeah. It's helpful um, yeah. in you know, kind of assuaging your fears yeah. or whatever it, it is. Um, and so we had another question come in where um, someone wanted to know if someone's going through a particularly difficult period yeah. in the, of their lives where they're just uh, maybe undergoing some intense suffering or persecution yeah. or, or whatever it may be. And we've all experienced those moments sure. where, you know, we're in the season of suffering and we um, either feel like we're just having a really hard time following God yeah. um, or uh, maybe we feel like God is just far away from us, yeah. that maybe we're looking for him and, and God's just not there. Yeah. Um, how can we continue on in that race? How can we yeah. continue pursuing God yeah. um, in those moments of suffering? Well, I'll just say this. Um, you know, one of the reasons that people kind of step off the course and walk away from Jesus, I think is in large part because of their experiences in suffering. Because right. what suffering does is it can call into question the goodness of God. Sure. Is God truly good? Right. Okay. 
because it, you know, it's God might be great. He might be all powerful, but he might not be caring enough to have done something, done something about my suffering. And so I think one of the reasons that people do kind of just abandon their faith or step away from Jesus is because they're suffering. They can't reconcile their suffering with God's goodness. Right. Um, so I, I do think that there is that, but if someone is, and so for those people, I do think that, that that's what you have to focus on. You have to answer the question, can God still be good and you suffer? Right. And the Bible says, yes. That's why Jesus says in John 16, in this world, you will have trouble. Mm -hmm. He spells it out for yeah. us. Suffering he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's him. That's your suffering and his goodness combined in one word, right. one verse. For those who might be suffering, they feel like God is far away. You know, uh, I would just say that the, the heart, I'm a feeler by nature. And so I want to, I want to determine how my relationship with God is doing based on how I feel. Right. And I love what a pastor friend says. He says, feelings are real. They're just not always reliable. Mm -hmm. And that is true mm -hmm. that, you know, um, when God feels just because God feels distant doesn't mean that he is distant. You think about right. all the commands God gave, do not fear for I am with you. Mm -hmm. God is committed to being present in our lives every moment of every day. But sometimes that, that feeling of his presence isn't necessarily there. And so we press into that, we press harder. And then there's times where that, that gives us an opportunity to be faithful, even right. in the midst of, of not feeling like the Lord is close. And those mm -hmm. are tough moments. Absolutely. Please hear me say that is, those are tough moments. Yet that those moments, as you know, Romans five talks about, they produce character That's right. in us yeah. being faithful in the moments where it's tough to be faithful it produces mm -hmm. that character so hang on right. just because it's like that this moment doesn't mean like it will doesn't mean it'll be like that always absolutely well that's i mean that's what faith is essentially it's not just believing it's trust and obedience even yeah. in those moments where god might feel yeah. incredibly far away yeah that's right absolutely so thank you so much timothy yeah. for being here with us today and thank you all so much for tuning in we will see you all next week Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.